the first session after lunch is always a treat, isn't it? Full belly, feeling tired. Um, and we've got some more quick fire stuff. We're, 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 we're chatting a lot because we're acutely aware that we're throwing tons of ideas and information and tools and that at you, but it's kind of our plan. We want to give you the tools so that you leave these four days with, um, you know, ways forward. So we're, we're quite aware that we're um, asking a lot and um, lots of lots of tools and, and, and ideas, but um, bear with us and hopefully, you know, by the end of it, you'll 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 have got a lot a lot out of it because of that, rather than us slowing down. So um, that's by way of saying that there's there's an awful lot that we've got just for this quick half hour. Basically, I'm just gonna in half an hour try and give you get you just started after a quick general introduction on the Max Ent approach. From a very practical perspective, we've got half an hour to get through this and we want to demo from a kind of practical user perspective how you can get the software up and running, loading your data. In effect, doing exactly the same as what we just did with running a biofid model in Open Modeler, but do it within the MaxM software and run a, a maximum entropy model. Um, I'm going to re be referring you to um, uh, literature in that to really read up and, and, and learn the details of how the approach works. I'll give you a very um, quick overview, but um, it, it really requires a lot longer than, than, than the time we have um, uh, to, to do that. Um, but uh, in particular, Stephen Phillips is the um, guy behind this, this uh, software. He's currently based in, in New York and um, uh, he's put out papers that are very user-friendly, at least as user-friendly as they can be, given some of the, um, the mathematics and the statistics behind these approaches, but he's put out papers and he's put out uh, documentation in terms of um, uh, like demos and tutorials and things like that for you, for you to work through. So all, all the goal really is for this half an hour is to give you a, a taster and get you going with, with loading in your data and running some basic models. <coughs> um, but, but, but first, just to emphasize, and this is obviously a slide that we showed this morning, there are a whole range of different methods out there. Um, some of those that Enrique has covered so far were referred to as more kind of presence-only, distance-based type approaches. Um, there are, are a whole other um, increasingly popular set of methods that probably more can be put under the category of machine learning. So these are approaches where we use um, computers to, to, to learn patterns in the data, in effect. And there are many different ways that, that this can be done, including um, uh, artificial neural networks, which are you know, modeled on the, the structure of the brain in terms of, 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 of networks of, of interacting artificial neurons within the brain, and, and these, these uh, computer algorithms that learn patterns in the data, so they, they kind of learn relationships between um, uh, environmental variables in our instance, and then, then the, 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 the presence <coughs> or, or absence of species. Um, after my half hour, I'm going to pass over to Enrique, I think, who's going to talk a little bit about um, GARP, which the, the, the GA in GARP is genetic algorithm. Um, that's another machine learning approach that uses, it, again, it's structured, it's kind of based on, 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 on a, the idea of natural selection where you're selecting algorithms, so struct kind of a, a machine learning approach that's again structured on or, or based on a natural phenomenon. Anyway, there are these class of machine learning approaches, it's a bit of a grey area between machine learning and statistics, but um, the couple of approaches that we're going to use now are um, basically fall, fall in that category. Um, the advantages of them are often that they can be very, very powerful in terms of fitting these response curves that we're going to talk about. Okay, so they can be extremely powerful in fitting very complex niches and giving very strong predictive performance in, in, in many cases. But I mention that because we spent a lot of effort this morning trying to get over this idea, in particular, of overfitting to the data and, and the limitations as well, or the, the the risks of using such powerful methods that that can that can um, uh, encourage you or enable you to overfit to your data um, so you don't really have the kind of predictive performance that, that you might think you have. Um, so there are a ton of different methods. This is just some, and, and there are new ones published you know, frequently in the literature. There's some really cool approaches that, that have been pulled out in the, just in the last year, some uh, uh, 
Bayesian approaches that, that we haven't got on our list and we're not going to really talk about, but, but have a lot of promise. Um, I just wanted to flag like just some key resources um, that we're going to focus on this week, one of them that, that we're not, but I, I just think it's so important that we wanted to, to flag it. So I'm going to show you now very quickly the, the MAXEN um, approach and focusing, as I say, on, on you know, the, the, a practical introduction to, to how to use the software. Um, we're then, you've already been using open modeling, you've run a bioclip model and you're going to run a dart model this afternoon um, using that same framework, so that's not using another software package, that's just uh, running another algorithm within um, the, the open modeler toolkit. Um, I really wanted to just flag, we're not going to talk about it this week, we don't have, we don't have the time and, 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 and we're not um, experts by any means in this particular approach, although um, I think we're trying to learn it, but there's a, a, a new package that Robert Heinemann and colleagues have put out um, in R. So those of you who are, if you like, conversant in R, who are, who are uh, R users, um, that's fantastic, and there are some real opportunities and capabilities that have been put within um, the, the R framework for, for doing a lot of these things. So the, the DISMO, which I think is short for distribution modeling package that Robert Hyman's and co have, have, have put out is definitely something to, to have a look at. It uses another package, a package called Rasta, which does a lot of GI, it has a lot of GIS functionality to it, and, and the two of them together um, you can run a whole bunch of different algorithms and do a whole bunch of different analyses. The kind of things that we're talking about, they can run, you can run MaxN, you can run a MaxN model exactly the same, using the same code um, that, that Stephen Phillips and, and colleagues put together for the MaxN software, can basically be called from, from R. Um, so there's all sorts of possibilities, you can do your evaluation statistics, you can divide the data up, you can draw maps to look at the results and, and things like that. So definitely if you're an R user, I'd encourage you to, 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 to look at this even if you're not. And that's one that we just wanted to flag as, 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 as important moving forward. Okay, so um, <coughs> what I'm going to do in, in, in a couple of minutes is actually launch up this um, MaxEnt tool and we're actually going to start, start playing with it. I've just got a couple of slides kind of two, three slides by, by way of introduction as a taste of that. As I say, it's a, uh, a whole day really that, that, that we would need and I'm certainly not the, the right person to, to, to give you the details of, of the mathematics and the, the statistics be, behind it. Um, so the best that we can do in a half hour is to, is to point you towards some of that literature, but really to get you up and running in a pra practical sense with actually running these tools. But as a, as a, as a general uh, overview then, um, this is an approach that only requires presence data, so it fits our theoretical kind of background that we've been building so far, that we, like, we often only have presence data, we have reservations often about the absence data, so this is a, a, an approach that's been developed that's, that's ideal for our, um, our purposes. It actually falls within the classification that we talked about before lunch of a presence background approach, and here's another way of visualizing that. Remember that was the idea that we only have presences, but the whole theory behind what the model is trying to do is it's trying to say how do the presences, how do the how does the niche that the species actually occur in, how does that compare to the the, the, the environments that are available for the species. Okay? Um, so that this is one way of, of visualizing this just in kind of one ecological dimension. If this is say uh, temperature or precipitation or any other number of excuse me, um, e ecological dimensions, and then this is the, the frequency of occurrence of a, of a particular uh, value, um, then what we can do is draw a, a histogram for our study species. So our study species, our species of interest, tends to occupy these kinds of environments. So again, it's that kind of response curve, if you think about it in that sense, that we would expect, a nice bell shape, but you know, it's, it's mostly occupying, it. it's frequently occupying these kind of uh, say temperatures are, are around what, whatever value this is and then it tailors off either side of that. But what this, this approach is trying to do is, is to compare what this study species occupies versus what is available in the study region. Okay? So this is an approach where you're in effect sampling from the background, lots of points, the default and what you're going to run today is 10,000 points, an awful lot of points 
and then trying to um, use the maximum entropy approach to, to say, well, well, where does my species fit within this landscape that's available? How do I characterize the niche within this landscape? And I'm flagging that because this is an approach that theoretically is very sensitive to the study region. Okay, so this is where it comes back to this morning's talk about dispersal capacity and movement in terms of trying to define a study area that tells you something about the environments that the species could potentially be sampled. You don't be including in your study area environments that the species would never have had the opportunity to actually sample. Okay, so um, I say theoretically we're quite sensitive to the study selection of the study region when we do these models. From a practical perspective, based on experience of myself and, and some colleagues, it's not terribly sensitive. I think there's still more work to be done on just how sensitive it is, but it's not terribly sensitive in some of the results that we've done, but I'm going to do uh, some of his results this morning. So, um, the important point is that you need to be thinking carefully about, about the study region. Um, this is an approach that crucially doesn't give equal weight to all the variables. A lot of the more advanced approaches are like this, but that's different to the biofilm approach that you used this morning, where it's basically looking at each variable and chopping up the, if you like, the maximum and minimum and then the percentiles within that that the species occurs in. But the, the, the first, second, third variable, all of them are treated the same. This kind of machine learning approach um, works in a completely different way, but it is essentially going to look at a variable that's going to mine as much information as it, as it can from that, but if it finds a variable that doesn't seem to have much importance for, for um, you know, there's not much information in there for, for defining the niche, then that variable will be downweighted. Okay? So it has this ability to, to up and down weight from different variables. Um, it can account for potential interactions between variables, which again is something that the biofilm model that we ran this morning can't do. It just treats each, indiv each individual variable in exactly the same way um, in, in, in its functioning, whereas um, approaches like Maxent can actually account for these interactions between variables. So you're not just going to say, well, um, the species can occur in you know, very, very high temperatures. The model is going to be able to distinguish that, well, it can occur in very high temperatures, but only if there's a lot of precipitation. Okay, so you're going to be able to look at those kinds of interactions, which you'll immediately think means, you know, it makes sense and it's going to enable you to characterize the niche in a, in a more advanced way. Um, this is an approach that can use categorical variables, and that's not always the case. Um, with many of the, the approaches that you'll see, they don't deal very well with categorical variables. What do I mean by categorical variables? Most of the variables we've looked at so far are, are, are continuous, okay? So, so you have, um, you know, temperature ranges from one degree to, to, to another degree, and, and precipitation is, you know, millimeters per year or millimeters per month or, or whatever unit. But there are certain variables, of course, that are just categories, and a classic would be, a classic example would be something like soil type, okay? So you might just have a, a, a set of categories of soil type where there's no relationship between one or the other, they're just different set. Categories. Another example might be land cover type or land use. So you might have, um, uh, you know, urban areas, semi-urban areas, woodlands, um, uh, lakes, and any 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 other number of, of, of different variables. So if you have variables like that, then this would be an approach where you can and will sensibly deal with categorical variables. And I'll, sh I'll show you in a minute how to actually do that in the software. Um, another thing that is, is important is that it has a very um, kind of intuitive but um, explicit as well in the way that it extrapolates. Not all models, it's very easy to see or understand how they extrapolate into, into parts of the environmental space that they weren't calibrated for. We, we, we've talked a lot about, about extrapolation. 